Welcome back to our series of videos on arches and bow trusses. In this particular video, we're going to look at the variations in the internal compressive forces. So here we have two trusses, one a parallel cord truss at the top here and a bow truss here. And we'd like to look at the difference in what's going on in terms of internal forces. For flooring applications and many roofing ap applications, we use the parallel cord trusses like the one shown above. These are generally fairly shallow, which makes them well suited to the floors of multi-story buildings where for economic reasons, we try to keep the overall height of the building as low as reasonable, subject to structural limitations. And one of the major limitations that we've talked about on numerous occasions is that when we make things too shallow, uh, they become too flexible or too rubbery. And if it's in a floor, people find that uh, perceptually uh, problematical because they don't like the feeling of the floors moving. Parallel cord trusses having all straight members are also simple and economical to fabricate. So we also use them in roofs. However, there are more efficient structural forms for roofing applications, such as the bow truss uh, in the image shown here. So here's a load diagram showing the forces that we're going to apply in, in this particular study. We're basically putting one kip on each of the interior joints and a 0.5 kip force on the end joints for the parallel cord truss. And then the base size for the bow truss is twice as large. So in order to have the same cumulative load across the top of the truss, we have to put a two kip force on each of the joints. So the span is the same, the total load is the same, it's uniform uh, in the spacing of the forces, but there are fewer forces and larger forces on the bow truss. This image shows the variation in the axial forces for the parallel cord truss and the bow truss. The web forces for the parallel cord truss are substantial and the cord forces are very large. So you'll notice the web forces here at the end, even though they're nowhere near as large as the cord forces, are pretty substantial. These cord forces, though, compared to anything else in the simulation, are enormous. So I'll remind you, this is the member. And this element that we're adding here, this graphic element, we're calling the flag. And the flag for this member, for the axial compression in this member, is drawn with this large width in order to express the magnitude of the large force that exists in that member. Likewise, for this member here, we have this tension force flag which we have represented in a different color. So yellow is compression and this uh, cyan or turquoise or whatever is for tension. So you'll notice in the web members, the forces are very small at the, in the middle, but they increase linearly as we move towards the end. And by the time we get to the end, these web forces are fairly substantial. The web forces in the bow truss are negligible because the top cord members have variable slope and by using that slope they are taking on the role of the web members in resisting the vertical shear force. So unlike the parallel cord at the top, neither one of these cord members has any vertical component to it and therefore they cannot resist any vertical force but these members right here have a vertical component. They have a slope and therefore can take on vertical forces. So the shear forces in the bow truss are actually being taken up in the ever increasing slope of the top cord members. And in this particular simulation, I've given the top cord the perfect shape so that in fact, 
the web forces are zero. The chord forces in the bow truss are much lower than the chord forces in the parallel chord truss. So these flags right here are by far the largest. The largest for the bow truss are these flags, which are obviously much smaller than there. So the chord forces in either compression or tension in the parallel chord truss are both much, much larger than any of the forces that we observe in the bow truss. Again, we notice absolute uniformity in the tensile forces in the bottom chord, um, some variation in the top chord, which tells us up here we're mainly absorbing the horizontal component associated with the internal resisting moment. But as we go down, we're sloping the member more and more. The horizontal force doesn't change, but the vertical component does change which is why this force right here at the base is slightly larger than the one at the top. <clears throat> so, as we, as we said, the cord forces in the bow truss are substantially smaller than in the parallel cord truss, and this is a simple lever arm argument. The lever arm here is from there to there. The lever arm for the bow truss is from there to there. Also, notice the extreme variability in the chord forces for the parallel chord truss. Um, they are essentially varying parabolically with incremental jumps associated with the force transfer at the joints and the application of additional forces at the joint. But this is a parabolic shape and the moment is being accommodated by this variable force because the lever arm for this bow truss is the same all along the length. So we're, we're accommodating the variable moment with a variable cord force, top and bottom. Now, the problem with this in the parallel cord truss is that unless it's a huge truss where it's worth our effort to make each one of these cord members different, we're actually going to fabricate this truss with a continuous member across the bottom and a continuous member across the bottom, uh, excuse me, the bottom and the top. And we do that because it drastically reduces the cost. We don't have to provide connections in the top cord or the bottom cord that would be necessary to take advantage of the full strength of the cross section of the member. Joints like that are pretty expensive to make. So we're going to make this top cord a continuous member. We're going to make the bottom cord a continuous member. What that means is we're going to size the top cord for this force right here. We're going to size the bottom cord for that force. And then everywhere else along this truss, that cord member is going to be substantially over-designed. It's going to have more cross-sectional area than it needs to resist the force. So we would look at that and say, that's not a very efficient use of material. Interestingly, interestingly enough, parallel cord trusses are still so efficient and so economical that they are often the immediate choice even for roofing applications where we could choose something different. <clears throat> In spite of this inefficiency, parallel cord trusses are still very efficient and very economical. For structural efficiency in roofing spanning members, the bow truss is clearly superior. It has far greater depth for greater leverage. It has only two critical connections, really critical connections, right there and right there, whereas all these connections to these high force web members are also critical connections in the parallel cord truss. Finally, of course, the wonderful thing is we have absolutely constant force in this bottom cord, which means we size it for that force and it's that force everywhere along the way and we will size the top cord for that force right there um, which means it will be minutely oversized at the center here 
but still the use of material in the case of the bow truss is incredibly efficient. Uh, the bow truss is also better from the point of view of shedding water, although it still tends to be a little flat at the top, which is why we sometimes choose a triangular shaped truss instead. So this is a standard steel bow truss. Um, it's very economical to make. The uh, corrugated steel decking curves e easily to the shape of the top cord of the truss when the corrugations are running in the proper direction, meaning from truss to truss. So the decking is very stiff in the spanning process, but very flexible for being bent over these arches. Uh, because the web forces are negligible under this loading condition, we can remove them in the na analysis and the results do not change. This leaves us with a simple arch rather than a bow truss with web members. And the forces that we're going to apply uh, look the same as they did before. And the outcome of the analysis is the same because these were zero force uh, web members in the bow truss. Now, those web members are incredibly important under asymmetric loads. They're also very valuable in keeping the top cord from exhibiting roll through buckling, where it tends to sag inward here and bulge outward there. Um, but uh, this becomes a viable arch type construction. So it might look something like this. Um, the arches above have about the same rise, or the arches shown here have about the same rise as this arch, um, which means that there are no large axial force variations in these arches. We might want to have a higher arch to reduce the horizontal force and consequently the overall compression force in the arch. Arches with a higher rise have a greater variation in the internal force at the support. So you'll notice we have a fairly substantial force there and a substantially smaller one at the top. This is an example of a much deeper arch which was chosen to make this structure more efficient. In this case, there was ample vertical dimension in the structure to accommodate an arch of very high rise. Um, efficiency was tremendously important because the loading condition here is very severe uh, and there are long spans involved. So efficiency was tremendously important and that's why this arch was made as deep as it is. <clears throat> Sometimes the situation favors an arch of very high rise. For example, these train uh, bridges going across a deep valley, valley um, made it feasible to put in very large, tall arches, which are very efficient in handling gravity forces. Um, sometimes we're motivated to make an arch high for emotional, aesthetic, or symbolic reasons. This is the Gateway Arch in St. Louis, which is uh, has an observatory at the top, but it's uh, unbelievably symbolically important as the gateway to the West, which is what the city of St. Louis has been historically. This uh, diagram shows a range of arch proportions from fairly shallow at the top to very high rise at the bottom. So we don't have much rise here, a reasonable amount, but not a lot. Here we have a higher rise and here an even higher rise. And you'll notice the forces here are pretty uniform, slight variations in the compression force. But when we get here, they're quite large because the horizontal forces are the only force at the top and because of the high rise and the good leverage the horizontal forces are relatively small this arch to, begins to act more like a column really in the sense that the loads are accumulating accumulating as we come down the arch <clears throat> 
we can provide a good overall structural depth and at the same time reduce both the curvature and the variations in the chord forces by using a lenticular truss. So this is the classic geometry for a bow truss. This is called a lenticular truss. They both have the same depth at the center, so we expect the chord forces at the center to be about the same. But here we have this element is helping with the vertical component. That element is helping with the vertical component. So we expect that the variations in the chord forces are not going to be as severe. And this looks something like this. Um, the ratio of the maximum to the minimum chord force is this 18.822 over 18.077. So that ratio is 1.045. <clears throat> or in other words, this force is 4.5% more than that one. When we look up here and we take the ratio, it's 21.081 divided by 18.027. And that ratio is 1.169. So in other words, this force is 16.9% larger than that. So we have more variation for this chord member than we do for that chord member. The disadvantage to the lenticular truss is these web members are now non-zero force members and they have to be designed to resist buckling. So the only way this system can work is to have load shared. And this arch is actually sagging downward, putting compression in these members, and that's what's loading this bottom cord and allowing it to play a more significant role in this uh, structural operation. <clears throat> For practical purposes, this variation is not significant, and reducing to it to that is not significant but many people prefer the aesthetics of the lenticular truss to the aesthetics of the bow truss. And here are a couple of examples of really beautiful uh, historical bridges which are based on this lenticular geometry. And that ends our video examining the internal compressive force variations in trusses.